Hello, listeners. Welcome to another episode of the Jacob Shapiro podcast. As usual, I'm your host. I'm Jacob Shapiro. Imagine that. Partner and director of geopolitical analysis at Cognitive Investments. Uh, we got Shane back on the podcast quick. So we had Shane on a couple weeks ago to talk about um, French elections. We had to bring him back on to talk about the surprise or maybe the lack thereof because Shane was expecting the result that we got in French elections. Uh, so we talk about um, those election results, what's next for France. Uh, we banter back and forth uh, in a contrarian way about what's what's going on with Europe and even some closing thoughts on lap swimming etiquette in France. Stay around. You definitely don't want to miss my hot takes there. Listeners, if you want to talk to me about anything, the services we provide, um, speaking engagements, the weather in New Orleans, what books I should be reading, any disagreements you have with this podcast, please email me at jacob at cognitive.invest, jacob at cognitive.investments. Otherwise, please take care of the people that you love. I will see you out there. Thanks for coming on the, the show to talk about the French elections. Uh, I have lots of questions and I'll try to be a good surrogate for the listeners who I'm sure have lots of questions about this as well. Um, I don't know if you have this ex experience. Amazing how many French election experts have come out of the woodwork in the last three to four weeks, especially in the English language press. Uh, and I think one of the things we learned from the elections was that nobody really understood what the hell was going on, except you, because you came on here and you talked about what you expected. Um, and what, what uh, everybody has called a surprise was not that much of a surprise to you. So why don't you, I know you're a humble man, so why don't I tell you to take the victory lap and tell us um, what you expected when you came on, on the podcast last time and what's actually happened? Well, first of all, uh, thanks, Jacob. It's great to be here. And thank you for inviting me here to, um, <clears throat> to not gloat about uh, what I had said previously. Uh, to be entirely honest, uh, I, I made my predictions. Uh, this isn't too much of a surprise. Nonetheless, things did not occur in exactly the way I expected them to occur either. So I can't take full credit for seeing uh, things perfectly lucidly. Well, let, let's just begin with the brass tacks. So, I mean, people went in worrying about um, a, a majority even for the, for the national rally. Um, they didn't get a majority. People were also thinking, though, that if they weren't going to get a majority, they were at least going to be the largest party in Parliament and that Macron was going to have to deal with them in some meaningful way. They dropped to number three in terms of seats in the Parliament. And this is I, I want to get to the math here on this question because this is one of the things that confu that is confusing me. But the the group that won the largest number of seats is the New Popular Front, which is the left, which nobody had been talking about, and which I think Macron was expecting to bicker amongst itself and not come together. Instead, the Greens and the Communists and the far left and everybody else came together. And they have the largest number of seats now in Parliament at 188 seats. They don't have the majority, but they are the ones that are sitting in that catbird seat. Macron's moderate ensemble, 161 seats, so better than, than they thought before, especially after that first round, but still not very good. Although when you put that together with the Republicans, I don't know. It, it looks a little bit better than you would think. And then National Rally falls to 142 seats. I will say, though, I mean, there's something in here about how French elections work, because if you look at the actual voter share, um, it's different than the seats in Parliament. So maybe that's the first question I could lob to you. How is it that the National Rally won 37 percent of the vote, but it has which is by far the largest percentage of the vote, but only has 142 seats, comes in third place when it comes to the seats? Well, in short, the Republican wall held. Uh, the French have a long-standing tradition of uniting in order to thwart the far right from ever coming to power. This has happened multiple times. This happened in 2002. This happened in 2000, oh, sorry, 2022. Uh, most famously, it happened in 2002, but it also happened in 2017. And as Marine Le Pen's Rassemblement National has sort of edged forward and uh, seemed to be a more functional party over the course of the past decade or so, uh, it nonetheless has consistently held. Um, I think the the uh, the results that we saw are 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 a direct um, are directly related to that. So yes, sure, uh, thirty seven percent of the vote went to the Rassemblement National, and that that is a non negligible proportion of it. But I think what's more salient is the fact that the entire rest of the political spectrum vociferously refused to allow the Rassemblement National. Uh, to to attain power, the major preference here is not that, or rather, the major uh, fact here is not that thirty seven percent of the French were willing to vote for the Rassemblement National. It was that everyone else 
uh, <laughs> voted very much against them. And uh, that is important to take into account because that's that's the crux of the election. In reality, it wasn't really a victory for anyone, uh, including the left, although they did better than anticipated. What this was was a pretty straightforward uh, categorical rejection of the far right's vision for France. Hmm. What what do you think it would take for that wall to break down? What what would it take for them to get another 13% of the vote? Because that's what we're talking about here. 13% of the French electorate is the difference between them having a majority vote or not. And I mean, uh, turnout was 66%, which doesn't sound particularly high to me. I mean, I, I guess it's high if you compare it to the United States. That was the highest for a parliamentary second round since 1997. So maybe there's a bunch of voters just sitting on their hands that they think they can go after to get that 13%. But what do you think it would take? Do you, do you think it's literally just a, the Le Pen name is toxic? And if they put you know the young guy Jordan in there, that things would get better? Um, or, you do, or do you just think it really is, okay, like that's like 33%, roughly a third of the French population is going to vote for the far right. And, and that's just the way it's going to be. And it's never going to get any bigger than that. Uh, yeah, I, th I, I think all things considered, what they would need in order to garner more votes is, votes is to no longer be a far-right party. Um, <laughs> this this has been going on for a while. Marine Le Pen has done, really, she actually has done a bang-up job cleaning up the party, but I think, how do I put this? One of the things that absolutely changed was over the course of the election, as they, uh, as the uh, after the first round, and as we went into the second round, they began to change the way that they were speaking. They were so uh, certain that they would have a majority, uh, mm. that, um, they, they began saying a bit of the quiet part out loud. There was a lot of, um, a lot of the things that hadn't necessarily been mentioned, uh, uh how do I put this, uh, policy elements that really were much harder than people initially thought that started to, to come out. And this was already, you know, to some degree visible in the, uh, in, in the debate that occurred the evening following our, our previous discussion. Um, and these are the things that just turn voters off completely. France is not an inherently uh, reactionary country. It does have a strong right-wing tradition, but that is not that that cannot be easily converted uh, into uh, support for the far right. That being said, that being said, we did see the Republican wall begin to crumble on the edges here, and the salient uh, issue there was the confrontation between the far left or rather the the lack of a choice between far left candidates and far right candidates mm -hmm. uh, what happened wasn't that the republicain uh, decided to vote for the far right what happened by and large was that they simply refused to step aside uh in order to allow for uh, a candidate from la france insoumise so the the, the far left wing of the, the Nouveau Front Populaire, the New Popular Front, to run unopposed, which is what happened in the majority of other uh, districts. That's how this victory was technically possible. Uh, so a lot of Republicans maintained their their uh, their candidacy despite the fact that they were splitting the vote. And as a result of that, uh, the far right had a more uh, moderate loss than I initially anticipated. The other uh, counterpart to that is that the uh, center right actually actually got far more seats than a lot of people predicted, which you know is another thing that's uh, that's interesting because this is a party that by and large died in 2017 or has been you know subsumed as a satellite sort of a a, a, a Lib Dem equivalent uh, working on the margins of, of Macron's majority. So what happens next? Um, it doesn't look like, you know, I, I think we've been worried about Le Pen and people have been talking about Le Pen for a long time. I mean, M Mélenchon has, is his own sort of box of nightmares, I feel like, for the average French voter. So I'm not expecting sort of a far left takeover um, of the French government. But what do you think is going to happen next? Because um, Macron, for as smart a tactician as he's been, and we talked about this at the last podcast, I mean, I, I would call this failure. And it was failure not he he called the far right like he had the far right dead to rights um but he he didn't he basically underestimated the left and now the left um is in a pretty powerful position relative to where they've been in sort of previous elections so where do you think the government goes from here everybody 
is covering this in English media as, oh my God, it's a hung parliament. Nothing is going to get done. It's complete and total gridlock. This is unprecedented in French history. That strikes me as a little bit like melodramatic and over the top, but I wonder how you see it. I believe it's melodramatic and over the top. Um, I, I, <clears throat> how do I put this? I think it is very easy to overstate the uh, size of the French victory. I think the very first person, uh, sorry, the, of the victory of the left. I think the very first person who overstated it was Mélenchon. Uh, what three minutes after the announce, uh, uh, after they announced the results, he was out there proclaiming victory. I think this is no, no. This is what it is. They they didn't get a majority either, and in fact, they are also uh, far from you know reasonably far from two hundred seats. Yes, uh, the leftist coalition managed to acquire nearly uh, nearly. 200 seats and to be technically speaking the largest of the blocks of candidates but this is a coalition of parties there are really three um three significant factions in that you've got on the one hand la france insoumise so Mélenchon's party which got 75 seats uh you have the greens who account for another 30 35 seats uh and then you have the socialists who are another 65 seats so this is not exactly a position of strength for any of these parties. There are substantial policy uh, disputes between all three of them. Uh, the likelihood of them presenting in a united front, the fact that they presented a united front during the election uh, was um, unexpected to Macron. Yes, I will absolutely say that. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, it is, in, uh, it is incredibly unlikely that they will manage to maintain uh, a united front uh, in order to govern in any major capacity. And even if they could, they don't have the votes to do so alone. So, yes, it will be a hung parliament. A uh, more optimistic way of saying that is a coalition government. Uh, what we are most likely to see is something actually, in fact, the only um, uh, the only coalition that makes any degree of sense is uh, is a unity government that stretches basically from the Socialist Party uh, all the way to Les Républicains. Otherwise, no one has the votes. So. I think it's important to think of this not necessarily as a gridlock and um, an absolute halt to everything going on in France. I think instead it's a reprieve from everything going on in France. <laughs> um, it's important to remember that uh, Paris will be hosting the, elect uh, the uh, Olympics in a couple of weeks. Um, that frankly is, is, is going to be its own form of chaos. Uh, one of the critiques that was made of Macron, or one of the criticisms that was lobbed at him for uh, for his decision to call for a snap election, was how can you do this when you know the international eye is on France, when we've got so many things going on with the Olympics, etc. This is going to create chaos. I think right now what everyone wants uh, and what everyone needs, what the country needs, is a is a is a moment to quiet down. So. I suppose I could, I could describe very briefly what that's going to look like in, in just a few words. Well, yeah, pl please do. And, and tell, tell me who's going to be the prime minister while you're at it. Okay. Well, so first of all, <laughs> the assembly is going to meet. The assembly is going to meet for 15 days. Uh, they were already talking about, uh, rather, uh, before the snap election, there was an idea that they were going to take a recess starting on, uh, rather, take the summer recess starting on the 12th of July. Uh, constitutionally, they are mandated to sit for 15 days, which means starting Monday, they will be... Uh, uh, in the assembly for 15 days, that'll all be a process of internal jockeying. They'll be figuring out yeah, how exactly they to organize themselves. But even this is just a stopgap until, you know, the long French summer. When they return from that, hopefully we'll have a little bit more clarity as to, uh, well, who's actually in charge of the left? Because that's, that's the big important question. Uh, I, I can start by answering the question that it's not, rather, I can start by answering that it is absolutely not Mélenchon, and there is no reason to assume that to be the case. Um, as for who's going to be, as for who's going to be prime minister, uh, it's going to be a socialist. It's almost certainly going to be a socialist. I've heard, uh, the, the, the big name that I've heard recently was, uh, Bernard Kaznev, uh, who was formerly prime minister in 2016, 2017. He was also prime minister in 1997. Uh, he stepped away from the socialist party during their last collaboration with, uh, uh, with, uh, all of the other leftist parties. Uh, but uh, he would be the sort of sort of stopgap figure, a unifying figure that would make a lot of sense in a coalition government such as this. Uh, 
Olivier Faure, who's the head of the Socialists, would theoretically also make for an attractive candidate, except he seems quite indisposed to cooperate with, uh, with Macron's party in any capacity. So we'll see whether that changes over the course of the next few weeks. That's also going to be an important, uh, an important question. Um, there's the off chance that it could be um, the former president, François Hollande, who was just re-elected, or rather who was just mm. elected again after a, a period uh, outside of the public eye. Although that strikes me as a, uh, as a bit of a long shot as well. He's, he's still not that popular after, uh, after all these years. But yeah, no, it's going to be a socialist. Uh, in all likelihood, it's going to be a socialist. There's going to be a center, uh, sort of center-left coalition. Uh, and what we can expect for the next couple of months is that France will be focusing uh, on uh, intra-party jockeying on the one hand and then on the Olympics on the other. Hopefully, this will mean uh, a little bit of calm. What does it mean for the rest of Macron's presidency in terms of some of the reforms that he's either pushed successfully in the past or has been still pushing forward? I mean, remember, he he upset everyone when he tried to lower the retirement age by a year or two. I forget exactly what the exact lower it was, but he got, he got a lot of pushback from that. And we also talked last time about the EU just beginning in a sort of perfunctory way to sort of talk about French debt and uh, deficit spending and things like that. So are we expecting, oh, socialist prime minister, more French government spending and problems down the road with that? Are we expecting, as you said, just intraparty jockeying and probably not a whole heck of a lot is going to get done? How do you see the roadmap for the rest of Macron's presidency playing out? Uh, well, I'll get to the um, I'll get to the European stuff in a moment. Uh, but as for Macron's presidency, I think I think his party uh, comported itself well enough to allay too many questions about uh, his overall ability to govern. For example, I, I think there's very little chance that he'll step down. Uh, and I think most of the reforms that he has passed over the course of his presidency are probably intact. However, those that have been passed and have not yet been enacted are more likely to be on the chopping block as a good faith measure in order to get the left in line. Mm -hmm. um, I can't remember, there's a, there's a pretty major one uh, with regards to uh, pension reform mm -hmm. that, uh, that will almost certainly be eliminated in order to, in order to um, foster uh, esprit de corps. <laughs> but uh, as for new spending, that's kind of up in the air. That depends exactly on uh, whether or not the party is involved. Well, actually, yeah, that, I suppose it depends on your entire view, rather your, your your overall view on France. Do you have a pessimistic view of what's to come? In which case, yes, there will be a great deal of uh, bickering. Uh, all of the parties will hold to completely unrealistic, to the same unrealistic standards that they presented during their uh, campaigns. And in which case, nothing will get done. Yes. Or... Uh, do you imagine that France will, in fact, be able to govern itself in some capacity in which people will, you know, uh, the officials will pull back from these positions and will expect something much more moderate, uh, in which case we can probably expect not too much new spending? I will say that there is, broadly speaking, recognition um, that uh, there is a need to hold to at least somewhat uh, or respect, rather, the concerns of the European Union that French debt is, in fact, uh, an issue that will need to be resolved, that has not been resolved under the Macron presidency, and I suspect it's going to be uh, a major talking point over the next three years. That mean, yeah, that makes sense. Go on. Or, mm. were you about so, to Europe. Um, oh, actually, no, no, I, I answered that question to some degree, but we can we can continue onward with... Uh, with, with a new impulse to that question is well no no I, I I so I want to I want to ask one more question about France domestically and then then let's cast our eyes on Europe which is to say um you know what ha like so we've talked sort of what happens during the rest of Macron's presidency I wonder what you think this sets up in terms of <laughs> which it's uh it's almost um masochistic to talk about this but the next French election when Macron can't run um, and I wonder how this result sets up the centrist in general, because if you believe um, sort of a lot of the reporting on Macron's decision to call early elections in the first place, part of it was, hey, the polls were showing the far right coming. And if you had two more years of disapproval of Macron and dissatisfaction with French government policies, maybe your sort of 
uh, ushering in that 13% that the that the that the right needs to get into power and that by doing this by giving them enough rope they will hang themselves i mean they gave them they gave them enough rope to hang themselves within a couple of weeks so that worked out but what do you think happens in the next election is it more hey we don't like this macron guy but the center is holding and there just needs to be a qualified centrist candidate and he'll be he or she will be able to beat off the Melanchons and the Le Pens and thing and things like that. Do you think it really depends what happens over the next two to three years? What do you think the we know that the short term gamble from Macron failed. So what I'm asking is, did the longer term gamble pay off? Do you think do you think that he took a lick now in order to set up a better situation for French centrists when he's no longer at the top of the ticket? Well, I mean, for one, it's not entirely apparent to me that the short term gamble failed. I'd call it more of a mitigated success. Uh, because yes, a broad, uh, uh, I don't think Macron was necessarily under any illusion that he would gain seats, uh, during the, during the election. Although, you know, maybe he was, um, but I do think that the main purpose of this gambit was to, uh, defeat the far right. And in that, with a little help from their hubris, uh, in that this gambit was a resounding success. Now, as for uh, in the long term, I think it's it's too soon to say for sure, but I do think that there was one important thing that happened over the course of the election uh, that sort of speaks to this overall issue. Macron realized finally just how much people hate him. <laughs> um. He did his best to stay away from his candidates. He did his best to stay uh, out of public sight, uh, so much so that it was uh, noted and notable. And he let centrism, to some degree, run on its own. Now, one of the things that I mentioned in the previous interview, and I'm going to bring up now because uh, I, I see that it's actually still the case, is that Attal, Gabriel Attal, the prime minister, is still one of the most popular politicians in the country. Uh, one of the, uh, the, the former prime minister, um, Edouard Philippe, uh, who, who was prime minister before Attal, uh, before Elizabeth Bourne, before Attal, uh, he was also quite popular uh, during his tenure. And he, in the wake of uh, the announcement of the results of the legislative elections, he all but announced his candidacy, uh, his candidacy for 2027. I think there very much is a future for centrism uh, in France. I don't think, uh, I don't think necessarily the centrist moment is over in, in that sense. I do think that people are, are broadly sick of Macron, uh, but this doesn't strike me as uh, the same sort of environment we saw in 2017 uh, when Les Républicains and the socialists collapsed simultaneously. I think there's a good likelihood that the centrists will be able to limp forward and possibly stand a fighting chance in 2027. Although, to be fair, we're still three years out. Fair enough. Um, so let's maybe move to um, to Europe, which is where uh, Le Pen, I think, was um, <laughs> was licking her wounds. Um, so as as the election defeat is coming through in France, she appears and says that she has joined forces with Viktor Orban and with Matteo Salvini for a new right wing alliance in the European Parliament uh, styled the Patriots for Europe. Uh, I'm half expecting like all these different groups to like take out a Confederate flag <laughs> and run. Or, I don't know why. That's just like the image I have in my, my brain of some of these. It's probably unfair. Um, but I think these talismans get passed back and forth. But as I said, Salvini's in it. Orban's party is in it, Le Pen is in it, and they're going to be sort of the third largest force in the European Parliament. So even as Le Pen, um, you know, takes a defeat in France, the right in, in the European Parliament, again, we're, we're talking about the third largest faction in the European Parliament. So I think there has been way too much made about a, a, a move towards the far right in the European Parliament in general. But you can say that there is this sort of faction that is emerging and this this network of alliances between these far right leaning parties in different European states. Um, and then of course, we also have sort of alluded to what is France's relationship with the European union. If Macron had his druthers, it would be 
probably reshaping the European Union, kicking a couple countries out, or at least creating those concentric circles so that some of the countries can't hold up the aims of the ones in the center that want to come together more, in which Macron would like, you know, decision to be made from Paris, probably in that in that scenario. Um, but I, I wonder what you think is is what are the implications of this election for France's relationship with the European Parliament? And, and how do you parse sort of the general mood in Europe? Okay, let's start with um, the, emergel, the, the emergence of this new far-right party within the uh, European Union. Um, how do I put this? I'm happy to say that this is also something that uh, I saw coming uh, and that I wrote about uh, before the, the French elections. I, I, I do find it necessary to nonetheless state that you are absolutely correct. Too much has been made. Uh, of the far right's place within the broader European uh, European Union, and that you know, despite uh, substantial success in both France and Germany, uh, on the whole, the center the, the center held at the European level. Um, today and yesterday, uh, new appointments uh, were made at the Commission level. So the executive uh, the 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 executive has been you know broadly decided at the European level. Uh, a lot of the the um, ministerial positions have been filled, well, so to speak. Uh, but the actual people who will be deciding what is happening at the European level have been chosen, and uh, the far right has been pretty decisively uh, excluded. Uh, this new party, Viktor Orban's party, uh, was excluded on a technicality because they uh, they registered too late, but. Uh, as for everyone else, they were uh, they were they were politely uh, asked to step aside, because again, the EPP and its centrist coalition has more or less held at the European level. So, uh, when it comes to the decision makers in Europe, they have already been chosen, and they have been chosen. Uh, they're much the same. Like we're seeing return of von der Leyen, we're seeing return of a, a bunch of uh, members who were, who were previously there. Europe's Europe's overall direction has not changed. Um, it's also important to note that I think you've correctly assessed the level of seriousness that one can associate with uh, these ever-changing far-right parties at the European level. Uh, when you brought up, you know, the the, the Confederate flag, uh, f th there's a lot of uh, grand name changing and invocation of symbols, and not a ton of, you know, actual power going on. The one exception to that is the ECR, which you know was always less far right and more Eurosceptic. Now it's very much turned into um, an extension of uh, Giorgio Maloney's party at the European level, uh, of Giorgio Maloney's power at the European level. Uh, so perhaps you know there's there's some place for them, but for everyone else, for ID and for this new party, I really don't think there's any, uh, any chance that they're going to uh, assume new responsibilities or uh, capture a ton of attention. When it comes to the Rassemblement National specifically, they are currently under investigation uh, at the European level for uh, embezzlement. I believe they—I uh, can't remember the, the the technicalities, but you know, uh, misuse of public funds. I believe was the uh, the the salient issue, and it was just announced actually that the Rassemblement National is also under investigation for the uh, 2022 presidential election for mm -hmm. uh, for much the same. Uh, sorry. Are you good? Some technical difficulties there. Uh, you're good. Uh, I'm sorry. I lost my train of thought. <laughs> European level. Yeah. Yeah. No, there's no, there's no real likelihood. The, the, I'm not going to say the far right is spent at the European level, but certainly uh, there's been a pretty resounding uh, defeat uh, domestically in France uh, and during the European elections. And I think, you know, it's important to read the tea leaves there because this is not the only major defeat that they've had. Uh, there was um, there was Poland, uh, the Netherlands, despite the 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 recent victory of um, of Gilt Wilders. Uh, I think it was in November. Uh, they managed to form a coalition, but they they broke for uh, for the centrists in the European uh, in the European elections. Like there have been 
an abundance of data points pointing to the fact that perhaps Europe is not on the path towards a fascist revival. And I think it's really important to remember this. I'm with you, but l l let me take the contrarian point of view here, which is I get nervous anytime we're sort of analyzing a democracy and the entire electorate has to band together to go against one faction that has very strong support behind it. So I think the devil's advocate to your point of view and, and using the French election as, as an experiment or as a laboratory for this, you're absolutely right that the, that there was a Republican wall against the far right and the far right couldn't take power. Good. They got their 37%. That's nice. They're never going to actually break through, but it seems to me that it's the 37% believes in something believes in something very passionately. Whereas the rest, I mean, this goes back to the, the Yates poem about the, about the center not holding, that the best lack conviction, the worst are full of passionate intensity. It's that nobody actually agrees on anything. So it's why, okay, the socialists and the communists and the greens and the centrists and the gaullists, they all come together and say, no Le Pen, which, okay, that's fine. You can win an election doing that, but you're not actually going to enact policy that is going to affect people if the only thing that you have in common is we don't want that one. And we're seeing this play out in the United States right now. Um, it has been, you know, a sort of no Trump coalition for quite some time. And that begins to break down because eventually you get apathy or you, you, you get problems in the coalition against it. And yet the people who are supporting that point of view passionately are still there. Um, so is there something to be said for the fact that, you know, yes, it's, it's not, I think it's a mistake to talk about fascist takeovers in Europe. That's World War II thinking. But it does seem to me that the, the problem is that the far right has a passionate base, has an idea that it's pursuing, and that nobody really has an alternative, which is one of the reasons Maloney in Italy is so interesting, because she's on the right, but she has a different point of view. She, like, especially with her foreign policy, she doesn't want anything to do with Russia. She thinks that Russia needs to be defeated in Ukraine. She doesn't have a lot of the skeletons in the closet that a lot of these far right groups have. When you look in there, whether it's Le Pen's past or alternative for Deutschland and talking about, uh, you know, um, uh, that the that what happened in Nazi Germany wasn't so bad. I mean, you go down the list, there's lots of skeletons there. She doesn't have it. But how would you respond to that pushback that it does seem like the far right has something, whereas everybody else has nothing. And eventually, if you don't have something that you're going for, like that coalition is going to fall apart and they're going to break through the wall. Hmm. Well, to respond to your point about enthusiasm. Uh, and again, I would suggest that this be taken with a grain of salt because I am speaking from a French perspective here. But I would say uh, that it's necessary to flip it. There is enthusiasm across the political spectrum to reject fascism. And that, I, I don't think that should be understated. This is not an election where, you know, we're not looking at, 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 at you know, subsequent elections where the Rassemblement National is creeping forward as, um, as voter participation decreases. No, 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 no. This was the reverse. This was, again, as you mentioned correctly, this is the, uh, the, um, this is the legislative election with the most voter participation uh, since the 90s. I believe it was 97. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and that... That really, you know, that means something. People absolutely turned out with the express purpose of blocking the far right. That itself is a conviction. Meanwhile, meanwhile, the Rassemblement National has changed, yes, but the way it has changed is been has been by stepping away from its convictions. What the Rassemblement National has done is that it has done its best to become more and more of a protest party and feed off of a broader disillusionment. But again. That's an absence of conviction or a conviction in the absence of, uh, of efficacy in the overall political system. Uh, that's, that's, uh, that's not exactly a force for driving change. That's despair. At best, it's, uh, at best, it's, um, dissent at worst, it's despair. Mm -hmm. Maloney. I don't know. I, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Just, just to speak about this very quickly. Uh, I think, I think Maloney is an, uh, is an odd duck, uh, and, and, I think when you look at the way she has governed, while she has spoken to some of the points of contention uh, that are uh, that are particularly interesting for the right, say immigration, especially from North Africa, uh, I think she has broadly governed in a pretty conservative uh, way. 
and I think this is reflected in her choices of alliances at the European level, her ECR refuses to have anything to do with Alternative for Deutschland. It refuses to have anything to do with the Rassemblement National. She has, by and large, kept herself away from these more extreme far-right parties. And I realize, you know, we're entering... Uh, we're entering interesting territory when I have to say, well, you know, this far right party, which is to the right of this far right party. But, but nonetheless, I think it's interesting to see that she has, uh, she has nonetheless kept herself closer to the uh, traditional conservatives than she has the actual or rather other other members of the far right. The other thing is that, uh, you know, Italy itself. Uh, I mean, France has colorful politics, but come on, Italy is a. It's its own case. This is a country that was governed by Berlusconi for the longest time. This is a country that has had several technical governments, uh, technocratic governments in the past uh, in, in, in the past decade and has a very interesting history uh, with European regulation. In addition to being a country uh, that is you know, demographically in a very different place from France, say. So uh, I think there are, there are some, to some degree, I would say, extenuating circumstances uh, and asterisks abound in the case of Italy and then... Uh, with an eye more on France, I think actually the convictions are much more strongly arrayed against the far right than they are arrayed for the far right, which is not necessarily the case in the U.S. either. Yeah, I mean, again, I'll I'll, I'll play devil's advocate and push back and say, because to your point, as soon as the far right thought that they were going to win, they started saying the quiet part out loud. So they can talk in public about how they're distancing themselves from the conviction, but the conviction is there. And I hate the reducto ad Hitlerum, um, but if you go back to Germany, 1920s, 1930s, everybody thought that Hitler and his thugs were a joke and that there was no possibility that these jokers were going to get anywhere near the halls of power. And as things got worse, um, eventually they break through in an election and, oh, they still think that they can handle them, but let's give them more rope to hang themselves so that they can really discredit themselves. And then you're sort of off to the races. I, I, I hesitate to make that metaphor because I think too often we're looking at 1920s, 1930s Germany and saying everything is like 1920s and 1930s Germany. But I do think there is something to the point that this is not the sort of thing that happens incrementally. You get pressure that builds up over time. And then to, to take your metaphor, you burst through the wall. And, and here's where I would go back to some stats that we ended our last podcast with, but which I think are, are worth ruminating on a little bit. So if you go to the latest Eurobarometer poll, you know, you ask, are things going in the right or wrong direction in your country? Uh, in France, 76% of people say things are going in the wrong direction. And that is the biggest percentage in the entire European Union. You ask it differently. Oh, are things going in the right or wrong direction in the European Union? 65% of the French say things are going in the wrong direction. That's, again, the biggest percentage of any country in the European Union saying things going in the wrong in the wrong direction. It's bigger than Greece. It's bigger than the Italians that you were just making fun of everything else, um, which goes back to the where we started the conversation, because we can argue about the far right till we're blue in the face. But I think the bigger question really is here. What is France's relationship with the European Union going to be going forward? Because Macron is saying one thing, and I think the centrists would say one thing and economic interests would dictate one thing. But if you look at the actual polling data, the polling data says now nah, somewhere between 65 and 70 percent of the French say things are going in the wrong direction in the European Union. Now, you can say, aha, that means that they support Macron's reforms and they want it to be a better European Union. Or you can more likely say this hasn't been good for us. We are angsty. We are looking for someone to speak our language, which is why we'll vote for crazy Melanchon and his communist, you know, coterie of communists, or we'll vote for Le Pen and her crazy policies on deer hunting and her nefarious ties to Russia and things like that. So I, I wonder like how you respond to, to, to how these election results are going to tell you what the future of France's relationship is with Europe. Maybe it's just, you know, the, the ambivalence that the French are famous for, that they'll they'll tell this to a poll, but really, like, they want to be part of the European Union. But the, the data is not telling me that right now. You know, I don't think you're wrong. Uh, in a lot of ways, I think you're, you're, you're making a pretty, uh, pretty important point about, you know, where things are going and the degree of dissatisfaction there is with, with, with the European Union. Um, I think there are two important things to remember when it comes to France specifically. Um, well, three, three. Let's start with the easiest. The first is that there's a lot of misunderstanding as to what Europe does, uh, and and this, you know, this is is gradually easing over time as the European Union becomes a more uh, 
direct force for, uh, you know, in, in people's lives from a regulatory perspective, uh, you know, simply talking about it more in the press, there's more visibility, et cetera. Uh, you know, for example, the turnout in the European elect, uh, the European legislatives was actually, uh, higher than it's been. Uh, and that's been inching forward over the years. I think that's important to remember. So, you know, despite everything, the French are participating in European elections and they're participating you know, sure in ways that favor the far right. But even this far right has sort of stepped away uh, from leaving the European Union and has sort of moved towards Euroscepticism, you know, softer Euroscepticism. Uh, last time I said that there was a turning point in 2022 with the invasion of Ukraine. I still think that to be the case. I think that if the, uh, if, you know, say, assuming, you know, let, let's, let's assume that tomorrow so, somehow Marine Le Pen uh, was handed control of the European Union. I think there would be a lot of uh, support for her rolling back uh, a lot of commitments, but I, I do think that there would be some pushback to doing away with it altogether or to uh, Frexit, say. Uh, so, so there is that. The second thing is, is that historically speaking, France is a country, uh, France is a European country that has always valued its independence. Um, this is why France stepped out of NATO. This is uh, sort of the broad tradition of de Gaullism, which I'm sure you will agree wasn't exactly a radical, uh, a radical position. This was, in fact, the uh, standard conservative uh, ideology for the better part of 60 years. Uh, France has always valued its ability to act independent of other countries. And so uh, there are costs uh, to pride and more you know, straightforwardly to, to, uh, to the ability to maneuverability in stepping away from, from pure independence and towards a, a coalition. And that's not something the French are, are, are very used to doing. Mm -hmm. um, as for the third point, um, <laughs> about the dam breaking and the fascists suddenly spilling out into the streets. Oh, yes, actually, no. Um, about uh, Reducto ad Hitlerum. I agree. I revile it as much as you do. But quite frankly... Uh, when I was looking over the results of the election, when I was looking over the results of the first round and wondering whether or not uh, we would end up with a uh, Rassemblement National minority, uh, large minority, but near majority, and a comparatively uh, weaker conventional conservative party, I was thinking specifically of the 1933 election in Germany and how that, uh, how that played out. That, that seemed to me to be a distinct possibility. Happily, you know, looking at the results, uh, it, it quickly appeared to, to, to not be the case. But, but still, like, I think, it's a, I think it's, a, it's an entirely logical comparison to draw at this point in time. I don't think it's hyperbole. Uh, that being yeah. said, that being said, with regards to the overall support of the right, uh, I do think it's important to note that in the second round of the presidential elections in 2022, um, noting again that early 2022, so January 2022, was, in my opinion, sort of a high watermark for fascism in France. Marine Le Pen uh, received 41% of the vote during the presidential election. That is huge. Uh, and this time, the Rassemblement National only garnered 37% of the vote. This is despite the fact that, you know, there were other parties, uh, the, the, the other far-right party led by Zimmer, it completely collapsed and sort of folded into the, uh, well, not officially, but its, its supporters certainly folded into the Assemblée Nationale. And then, of course, there were the, the fringe Republicans who also decided to join the, uh, the uh, rather to ally with the Assemblée Nationale. Despite all of this, they still got a smaller proportion of the vote than they did in, uh, in the 2022 elections. I think, again, that that is indicative of a broader change. Of course, you know, two data points don't make a trend, but like, allow me a little hope. <laughs> um, another poll that I thought was particularly interesting. Um, so again, this is spring 2024. So pretty recently, um, the poll asks at the present time, um, would you say that things are going in the right or wrong direction in your own life personally? Um, and the results are almost too perfect here because 37% of French people say that things are going in the wrong direction and 37% is what 
what the far right got in this particular particular election. The flip side of that, though, is 63% say things are going in the right direction. So even if there is dissatisfaction with politics, with the government, with the European Union, there is a sense from a majority of people that personally, in my personal life, things are going in the right direction. And I think one of the huge differences between, say, a Germany in the 1930s and this right now, I bet you if you took a poll of Germany in the early 1930s, people, 63% of people would not say that things in their personal life were going in the right direction. Um, that's still, by the way, fairly low for the European Union. It's not at the bottom. Uh, Portugal claims the bottom rung position. I wonder if you can guess a little trivia for you. Which country do you think has people who are says things are going in the right direction? 85% of people in this country say things in their lives are going in the right direction. Care to take a guess? Mm-hmm. Um, I'll, I'll give I you a little hint Poland. here too. It's, it's also the same country. Okay, so your first guess is Poland. It's wrong. Uh, yep. I'll give you a hint here. Uh, this country also has the largest percentage of respondents who say things are going in the right direction in the European Union. So 49% of them say things are going right in the European Union. And the second uh, highest percentage of people who think things are going right in their own country, 52%. It's got to be one of the Baltic states, no? It is Ireland. Uh, so apparently the water in Ireland, something good is going on. I, I find that highly surprising, but um, all right. Why? Why do you find it highly surprising? Uh, no, it's true that they've had a couple of good years, but you know, it's still coming off of, like, what was it? There was a major story a few, uh, a few months back uh, about uh, far right violence in the streets of Ireland. Um, obviously these things are just, uh, just as overblown about Ireland as they are about France, but um. <laughs> Well, I, I would actually say Irish politics. So I, we, we did some deep dive research here at the firm on, on Ireland because it was one of our countries that we wanted to be overweight. We think it's it's got massive geopolitical opportunities. I'm going to have to revisit that after the recent election in the UK because um, whenever the UK is a disaster, which is not often when you look back at the last couple of hundreds of years, like that's good for Ireland. So if the UK is going to have stable government, let alone competent government, like that might mean things for Ireland going forward. Um, but Irish politics is interesting in the sense that um, they have avoided most of the political polarization that affects most democracies. So the the delta between left and right in Ireland is narrower than it is in the United States, in the UK, in France. Um, it's a much more sort of at the top level moderate. They haven't had that level of political polarization. Now, maybe it's happening. Maybe you get the combination of migration and maybe economic troubles with the European Union. Like you could maybe see that reversing. Um, but it is an interesting aspect of Irish politics that um, even though it may look the same as some of these other democratic societies, it, it is not quite as radically or as effectively polarized as some of the, as some of the others. How to explain that, I don't know. Maybe it's Guinness, but um, that, that at least is, a tr- is true of their politics right now. Well, I stand corrected about Ireland, and I, I apologize to any Irish listeners. That, and, and for that matter, <laughs> I also of, apologize to... Um, <laughs> <laughs> for that matter, I, I'd also like to apologize for the Italians. No, this is, you know, how do I put this? From one country of dramatic politics to another, you know, it's it's nothing but a little good rimming between uh, between compatriots. You're, you're way too polite, and I think that's the American part of your heritage coming out, because we've had Dario Fabri, an Italian, on this podcast, and he's talked shit about France more than you could possibly imagine. So you should be scoring shots for your country, not apologizing for taking shots at a country that, uh, what, more elections than any other democracy in the world, I think, since 1945? Um, hey, look, any last almost thought, the last Shane? time a Frenchman took the high ground. Yeah, I, I don't know. We'd probably have to go back to the 19th century. Um, I mean, very, very memorably, Ridley Scott portrayed one example of that uh, recently. Uh, terribly, but nonetheless portrayed it. <laughs> um, any closing thoughts before we let you out of here, Shane? Uh, no, no, no. I think I think we've covered a fair amount of ground. Um, unless you have any further questions, you know, anything that comes to mind. My only, my last question is is completely personal interest because I was so excited that Macron, one of Macron's plans for the Olympics was to make the sand swimmable. <laughs> uh, is it swimmable? Are you able to swim in the sand, or are you staying away? Look. I wouldn't personally. Um, <laughs> there were plans for Macron to, for Macron himself and the mayor of Paris, to swim in the Seine in order to demonstrate its, uh, its uh, non toxicity. As far as I'm aware, although to be fair, I may have been, uh, as far as I'm aware, those plans have been postponed. And I, I don't know. The river doesn't look particularly clean. Although to be fair, it is increasingly difficult to 
uh, walk near it as entire uh, entire sectors of Paris are cordoned off for the sake of the Olympics. Mm. I um I was thinking about this the other day actually. So I, I was in Paris for a month back in twenty. Um, 17, 18, I forget. And I'm a lap swimmer. I swim to get most of my exercise. And so I, I wanted to swim in France and you guys have a lot of public pools. And I, I went and I, I went to go swim in this public pool, which was like in the basement of a, of a mall. It was really strange to get there. Um, anyway, and I can say that, um, uh, Parisian swimmers have the worst lap swimming etiquette of any country or pool that I've ever been in, in my entire life. You like, it's nice to see so many French people out and about swimming and being active, but they jam so many people into the lanes that you literally, and they go so slow. So it's like not actually exercise because it's like, you know, 15 or 20 people in a lane and they're all dog paddling. Um, and I was thinking about it because I swim here in new Orleans and I have to say that the title for second worst, uh, swim lap etiquette goes to the new Orleans JCC. Cause my God, these people are they're they're clutching their pearls a little bit too much but now i'm going way off track anything you want to say about the swimming culture in france or or should we let people go before i really go off the rails here look i'm going to use your example to speak to the overall tenor of the conversation and say you know where you see poor swimming etiquette i optimistically see a reprieve from the poor swimming etiquette of new orleans <laughs> well on that note cheers shane we'll talk to you soon Cognitive Investments LLC is a registered investment advisor. Advisory services are only offered to clients or prospective clients where Cognitive and its representatives are properly licensed or exempt from licensure. For additional information, please visit our website at www.cognitive.investments. The information provided is for educational and informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice and it should not be relied on as such. It should not be considered a solicitation to buy or an offer to sell a security. It does not take into account any investor's particular investment objectives, strategies, tax status, or investment horizon. You should consult your attorney or tax advisor. The views expressed in this commentary are subject to change based on market and other conditions. This podcast may contain certain statements that may be deemed forward-looking statements. Please note that any such statements are not guarantees of any future performance, and actual results or developments may differ materially from those projected. Any projections, market outlooks, or estimates are based upon certain assumptions and should not be construed as indicative of actual events that will occur.